Ocarina of Time mastered environmentally scary in a way that other actual horror games did not. And now that I'm thinking about it, nothing actually scary would happen a lot of the time. Okay, okay, except for the What's up everybody? Thank you for clicking on this video. Please hit that like button and that subscribe button. It really helped the channel out a lot. And let's get straight to it. Hope you enjoy. A genre that I rarely, and I mean rarely ever dabble into is the horror genre. I hate playing horror games. I hate watching horror movies. I hate horror. But I hate horror games especially because my brain stops working in horror situations. I go straight into action mode, even if that, even if I don't have any action to go into. But little does everybody know this very channel, yes, this channel that you're watching, starting out as a cooking channel. But I knew that I love playing games more than I love cooking, so I changed it to a game channel in the first gaming video I ever recorded I played Amnesia Dark Descent because I hate playing horror games and I felt that I would have a great reaction to being scared of one of the scariest games to ever hit the internet. Yeah, that takes me back to when I was using a white blanket as a green screen. To anyone who's ever played an Amnesia game, you know that it's very famous for two things. The why are you so jumpy? I ain't even done none to your ass yet. And it's also very famous for putting you into dangerous situations without like a gun or anything like that to defend yourself. You're just you're just helpless in a horrifying situation. And then, you know, every horror game has puzzles in it. That's like a consensus for horror games nowadays. But to make a long story short, that recording took so long because of all the puzzles that I failed to get through. The only horror games that I may play is a really great survival horror game like Resident <laughs> Evil or Dead Space whenever that comes out every once in a blue moon. Or the peak survival horror game, Luigi's Mansion. It's like, nah, I'm playing, I'm playing, I'm playing. But as y'all can see, I tend to stay away from horror games. That don't mean that they stay away from me though. The horror genre seems to show its ugly ass head in some of the most random games and it's wrong. The Lil' Kid Bread Show, he put down a lot of titles because of that very thing. And it took me for, you know, a couple years to go by for me to drop my nuts to pick up the controller again and try it again. And not gonna lie, I, I was scared of everything. Even the stealth missions in Call of Duty were enough to trip me up for real. There were a lot of games that I could have talked about and I could have included in this list that I won't get into because they weren't scary enough like the Subnautica Ghost Leviathan or the Robot Man from Red Dead Redemption 2. I didn't choose the Red Dead 2 Robot Man storyline because there was a lot scarier of a storyline in Red Dead Redemption 2 which is the Curse Village of Butcher Creek. If you've played Red Dead Redemption 2 then you know that Red Dead Redemption 2 mastered making side quests with main quest level of care and Butcher's Creek is a primo example of that along with a lot of the other great great Red Dead Redemption 2 side quest. It's easy to miss, even if you put hundreds of hours into the game, but a creepy ass old woman comes up to you to start up the Wisdom of the Elders quest line to find out the mysterious happenings of an old village. At first, you as the player may just think, okay, well, this is probably just the story of another abandoned homestead of a family that, that moved out west a little bit too soon, but nah, 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 nah. In classic Rockstar fashion, there is a charlatan shaman who is trying to turn a whole town of people into Powerpuff Girls using arsenic, lead poisoning, and a little bit of something nice. However, you know, the jingle goes. But yeah, the shaman was poisoning all the people, killing them and turning them crazy. But if you went to the shed in between 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., you may find a green glowing pentagram that alludes to something more than just lead and arsenic in the water. In my first couple playthroughs of Red Dead 2, I didn't encounter this village of Butcher's Creek, but it is little side quests like this that really make me love Red Dead Redemption 2 and why I think it's the goat of all video games. The level of care is just immaculate. But back to the horror. The kids game from the kids franchise that consistently chooses horror is Ocarina of Time and then again, and sometimes even harder with Majora's Mask. Ocarina of Time has its Lan Lan ranches, its Goron cities and Kokiri forests, but it also has its shadow temples, graveyards, and Kakariko village wells. And if you know, you know. Ocarina of Time mastered environmentally scary in a way that other actual horror games did not. And now that I'm thinking about it, nothing actually scary would happen a lot of the times. It was just a really creepy environment. Okay, okay, except for the re-dead zombies that would literally jump onto to child Link and Adult Link and force kids to helplessly watch a re-dead zombie suck the life out of Link 
one quarter of a heart at a time. Or the weird white globby things that did the exact same thing. And Majora's Mask was on that same type timing. And this time, Nintendo went for a much darker tone as you could literally see in the color palette that they chose for this game specifically. We won't even mention the super large and terrifying moon that had a evil face on it that was coming straight to Earth, promising destruction for everybody that nobody cared about except for Link and, and, and Navi. And hey, I can't forget Nabi. This game got so dark, this Nintendo game got so dark, there was corpses of Deku children in this game. And like I said before, if you know, you know. But if you don't know, I won't spoil it. But Nintendo didn't spare the Pokemon kids either. In Pokemon games, there was always abandoned houses, abandoned cruise ships, abandoned office spaces with little creepy ghost girls that would like crawl around and they would move on the side of the screen or something like that, make something float. Probably the most famous of these instances is the Rodham House in Sinnoh or that one weird creepy house in uh, X and Y. And the lore of the ghost girl sitting in Phoebe's chamber at the Elite Four in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire will always be a fun one because you know, why was there a chair there in the first place? And why are you referencing somebody sitting in that chair when nobody's sitting in that chair, you know what I mean? I watched a lot of videos of Pokemon lore on that back when I was younger. But the piece of lore that takes it all, that takes a whole cake, is the original uh, Pokemon Red's Lavender Town. The low-res theme musics. The pixelated ghosts. The kid that saw a ghost put his hand on you and didn't tell anybody about it. But then you go inside the tower. Not only are there crazy mediums in there that have lost their mind until you battle their level 18 ghastlies, but you had to fight the dead spirit of a Marowak mother who got their kid killed by Team Rocket and you had to peacefully send her to the afterlife? And. In the theme of killing Pokemon, your arrival Gary alludes to the fact that you, the player, killed their Raticate the last time y'all fought, I think, in Vermilion City in the cruise ship. On a cruise ship, nonetheless. Canonically, Pokemon protagonists are 10 years old, by the way. Maybe 11. It's not until Arceus and when they turn like 16. But whenever you put the game down to escape all the madness and everything, there was always like the creepy Pokemon videos online about missing no and <laughs> how scary that was. But if you were on YouTube in the early to mid 2010s, it wasn't Skibbity Toilet or Pokemon that you were fawning over. It was Hero Brian. Back in the day, I would put it on everything that Hero Brian was real. And I watched every lore video. I was putting in different seas for different worlds that there was rumored that he would pop up in. Sometimes they would say to change your FOV, your field of view up and down to see if he appears and see if you can see him in the distance or something. I would even play by myself in the dark to try to get this man to spawn into my world. And the legend of Hero Brian lasted for a while. This was back in the old internet when everything wasn't just, you know, lasted for a month and then everybody moved on from it. This, the Hero Brian legend lasted for a while and I wonder how it even started. It's like everybody came up in the community and was just like, yeah, Hero Brian exists and he's gonna kill you and there's nothing you could do about it, lore bread show. Minecraft has always been scary, even without Hero Brian. The Nether is always scary, especially if you're playing on hard mode, you will get zero life on that, at least on Bedrock Edition. They, they don't spare any punches. And in the Minecraft Cave update, Minecraft added in some even more scary things to put in their game for some reason. The cave sounds got scarier, but the reason why the cave sounds got scarier is because there was actually something in there that could kill you, which was the warden. There's no reward for beating the warden yet, but I played the boss fight as an adult and it is still terrifying. You'll be exploring the new lush jungle in the cave, and then all of a sudden you'll be surrounded by some black goop with different sirens alerting your location to some big brolic one-shot machine oh yeah and before he strikes he hits you with a blindness ailment which blackens your whole screen where you can't see five blocks in front of you and then he goes in for the kill like 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 some sort of snake shark mix truly truly nightmare fuel but just because we talk about minecraft don't think that we're letting nintendo off the hook because they love the whole lure the kids into an outwardly jolly game and then rug pull them with the creepy horror that they love to put in every one of their major titles earthbound is one of the quirkiest light-hearted games i've ever played if you ever talk to the npcs in that game you'll understand what i mean the music is quirky everything the, the, the whole question mark thing the meme the whole what meme yeah that music comes from earthbound i'm probably playing some of the earthbound music right now kyle play some of the earthbound music right now or you're fired but yeah there was a whole bunch of box 
unlucky levels of ridiculousness that happened in that game. Like, for example, using a magic eraser to erase a eraser statue. It takes a little bit of a turn when they task Ness with dismantling a happy happy cult that conglomerates in the forest every once in a while. But then after you go through all of that, it goes back to normal. Until the final boss fight, that is. The main villain of this story is Gigas, who is an alien overload that overlord that comes to earth and in the story he becomes a little bit too powerful and remember that one theory that the fake iron patriot I, I guess he's fake now but at the time iron patriot proposed that the avengers were to go back in time and you know off baby thanos and they were like oh yeah that's too dark we can't do that well, that idea was kind of greenlit in Earthbound, which ironically or unironically is called Mother 2 in Japan. So yeah, that was all the times where games just turned into horror games out of nowhere. In Nintendo, you, you are constant, constant perpetrators on that list and you have been for the last 40 years. So yeah, thanks for watching The Bread Show. That's everything that I have for y'all today. If you are still watching, you will like all of my other content. Please, please just go check out all of my other content. I love you guys. Spread inspiration and you know, no, spread love and give inspiration in all you do and peace out. Welcome to the Grand Show. Take two.